Hello everyone, welcome back to the second video in the Making a Mandelbrot Viewer in WebGL. Um, in the last video, whoops, that's not the window I wanted, that's not the window I wanted either. In the last video I kind of showed this is the effect we're going after. This is an old video that I made on making a Mandelbrot Viewer in C++, and all this did is it generated a PPM image and it took a while. It was a very long generation. Um, and we're going to be doing this in WebGL, and you should watch the last video if you want to see uh, the desired effect that we're shooting for. Great, so where we ended right is we have this full screen OpenGL canvas now that is available, and I wanted to start writing the shaders so that we can get at least something to look at. So our vertex shader is going to be very straightforward, and if you're not super familiar, I'm assuming you're somewhat familiar with WebGL or OpenGL. Um, if you're not, go ahead and watch some of my other videos on how all this works. We are going to be using high precision floats. Um, I don't really have a better reason for you. I'm just going to do it. Uh, and the plan that I'm going to do is I want to cover the entire screen in just two triangles. One that goes all the way across on the bottom left side and one that goes all the way across on the upper right side. And then it's going to be the fragment shader that's going to be doing all the work. So the vertex shader is going to be just nice and easy. All we're doing we're even going to specify in OpenGL coordinates where the triangle is going to be. So GL position equals vec4, the vertex position 0, 0.0 for the depth, 1.0 for whatever this is. Alright, so now our fragment shader is going to be a little bit more difficult. Um, so, let's see. Let me pull up. Do, 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 do. Hmm. Okay, here's the Wikipedia page. Uh, so we're going to be applying this formula. Um, I'm not going to cover very much about the mathematics of the Mandelbrot set. If you want to learn about that, you should watch the original video I did on this. I, co I covered all the math in the first few minutes. So again, we're going to be using high precision. I do need to know a couple of things. I need to know how wide and how tall the viewport is. Um, in actual pixels, like how many pixels across it is. So I'm going to make a uniform for that because that's not going to change between fragments. Vec2, VP dimensions. And I think there actually might be an OpenGL way of getting this, but I'm just going to pass it in anyways. Um, this will also allow us to, if we want to, do things like extra anti-aliasing, which I really don't think we should have to do, but I'm going to have it there anyways. Um, and then the other thing I'm going to need is I need to know, in our Mandelbrot coordinates, in our complex space, uh, what these corners are. So where our negative imaginary values are, maximum imaginary values, like how wide this is in real and imaginary space, respectively. Um, so let's see, I'm going to say vec2 for, um, you know what, I'm going to use floats. So min i... max i min r max r and that's just going to be four floats i could put this in a vec4 um, and that would actually prob probably be better on performance but i'm going to prefer floats simply um, for ease of communicating what i'm doing all right so the first thing we need to do is we need to get a starting point which is going to be our C value. Again, if you look back at this Mandelbrot recurrence, we're going to have two big important variables. We're going to have C and Z, and N, C, Z, and N, so three variables, I suppose. So this is going to be determined. Um, our real component is going to be, if you map our fragment coordinate in pixel space, you know, starting at 0, going to 18, or 1080, whatever it is, 1080 on a 1080 screen, um, and I need to multiply that by our real dimension across um, how wide that is. Uh, so I'm just going to be performing a transformation here, and that is going to be a linear interpolation. So the idea is, if I have a screen that looks like this, and I have real space that looks like this, these are going to be floats and these are going to be integers, I need to somehow transform this space into this space. Um, 
And the first thing that I can do is I need to multiply this entire thing by the range. So first step would be multiply by, let's see, so the range that we're coming from, 2.0 minus negative 2.0 divided by 1080 minus 0 is how we transform ranges. So that was is going to give us a number between 0 and 4.0, which we then want to transform into negative 2.0 to 2.0, which we can do that by subtracting 2.0 from result. And we want to do this for both our height and our width. Um, so we get our x position as so times and I want our maximum r this should be max r minus our minimum r divided by our viewport dimensions dot x and I think viewport dimensions yes this is going to be our width so I don't need um, like a maximum and a min cool and then finally I just need to add on what the minimum is so plus min r and then I'm going to do the same thing for our imaginary component so glfragcord.y times max i minus min i divided by viewport dimensions dot y plus min i should give us our initial c variable our starting point let's apply the mandel brought formula so our initial z value, z sub 0, is going to be just c. Float iterations so far. Float max iterations equals, let's do 2,000 maximum iterations. Why not? Now I'm going to make two different ones, one a float and one an integer. Um, just because I'm going to be using a for loop, and WebGL requires that for for loops you use constants and everything and this is so that it can unwind the for loop and it doesn't have to have any dynamic branching. I won't get into the details of why that's important but it is. Let's do, how about a for loop instead of a fought loop? Float t, alright. So now I'm going to multiply, I'm going to apply the Mandelbrot recurrence so the next value of z is going to be z times z plus c, and I'm going to be doing um, complex number mathematics. So I'm going to put a temporary value to store what the imaginary component of is z, so that when I compute the real component of z, I'm not overriding anything old, anything important. So float t equals 2.0 times z dot x times z dot y plus c dot y. Our real component is going to be z dot x. How about z dot x times z dot x minus z dot y times z dot y plus z dot x and z dot y equals t. If z dot x times z dot x plus z dot y times z dot y is bigger than bigger than 4.0, what I want to do here is I want to break. Now this right here is dynamic branching, and this is a problem. Um, However, we're not looking for anything super performance intensive, so I'm going to allow some really unoptimized code to sneak in there. Number of iterations, I'm going to add 1.0 to it. And then here at the end, I want to say my fragment color, frag color, is going to, well, let's do an if statement right here instead. Number of iterations. Max iterations, yeah. Um, so if the number of iterations which we have passed through exceeds the maximum number of iterations, then I just want to discard this. I don't want to. Um, I don't want to color this at all. Otherwise, what I want to do is the fragment color is going to be the frag color. How about instead of the frag coordinate, it's going to be. Let's make it just a solid blue color for now. Great, and if we reload it, we aren't actually using it yet, so it's fine. But you can see that now we have our text set for both of those shaders. So we have some shader text that we can use. Great, so this is the shader that I was using before that works just fine. So we should be able to leave this as is. Uh, you can take another final look at it. I'm pretty much just applying the Mandelbrot function right here. 
and then coloring it. If it's in the Mandelbrot, color it blue. Otherwise, get rid of the that pixel. Cool. So let's go in here and s do, 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 create um, create shader program. What else do I want to do up here? Create buffers. Uh, we'll create buffers later. Create buffers and yeah, that should be everything. Okay, so var vertex shader is going to be create shader gl dot vertex shader gl dot shader source vertex shader and I want loaded shaders dot vs text. Let's compile that shader. And if not gl dot get shader parameter vs gl dot compile status. I believe that's what it is, gl dot compile status, yeah. Console dot error could not create vertex. Um, vertex shader compile error. Mm -mm. And I want to also spit out get shader info log from the vertex shader. Great. Let's do the same thing with the fragment shader. Loaded shaders dot fs text gl dot compile shader fragment shader. Um, and we'll apply all of this except for to the fragment shader instead of the vertex shader. So now if we run this, what we should get is hopefully no errors. Here we go, we have an error. So this might be something where I was copying over a little bit too closely. Yep, yep I was. Iterations. So instead of, I, I called it NITS for number of iterations in my, um, in my sample and my code that I'm looking at, the, the code that I'd written before. Uh, and apparently I renamed it to iterations in here. Better variable names. So this should be IMAX iterations, just for integers. Cool. If I refresh that, great. Looks like everything compiles. Let's make our program. And then what is the name of the call? I believe it's attach shader. Yep, it's gl.attach shader. Vertex shader. Attach shader program fragment shader gl dot link program program I think it was link program yep link program if not gl dot get program parameter program gl dot link status so if we fail to link I want to output an error shader program link error shader info log program cool if we run that looks like everything is still working just fine I can get rid of this console logs up here we're done with those great um, oh one thing I am going to point out um, you are going to be having troubles using Chrome if you did not enable a certain setting and that is right here if you go into set in Chrome if you go into settings general disable cache while dev tools is open you're going to be having a hard time if you didn't do that because all of these files are going to be pulled from cached copies so any modifications you make to the shader will be liable to be completely ignored so thought I'd mention that so let's validate the shader now the program uh, da, 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 da. This is going to be a validate error. Yep, should be good. Is it validate or verify? Oh, it's a uh, validate program, not validate shader. Cool. So everything looks like it's running just hunky dory, which is wonderful. Um, get uniform locations. So let's get the locations of all of these variables that we're using in our fragment shader. Um, and I'm going to put it all into its own object. 
So our first uniform that we want is going to be viewport dimensions. And that is going to be gl.get uniform location program viewport dimensions. Um, let's actually right here, just right now, why not right off the bat use the program. And we're going to be using this for the entirety of this demo. And so I'm just going to use it right there and be done with it. Cool. So we need the viewport dimensions. I'm just going to grab all of these because we also need them. And let's do a little bit of sublime magic. Select on the semicolons, why not? I kind of wonder if this works. Oh, that is fancy. I've never tried that before. Get uniform location program. So what I did right there is with these multiple cursors, and the multiple cursors you can do, by the way, if you just click on multiple places on the screen while holding control, or if you select a character and press control D, it'll keep selecting the next instances of that. Apparently when you have multiple cursors, um, you can copy things and it will keep what's copied at the individual cursor, so that's kind of cool. Learning something new every day. Great. So that's all those. Fantastic. Um, let me just reference my notes again really quick. Boop, 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 boop. So every time we update, we do also need to um, set CPU side variables for all of our shader variables. So our viewport dimensions is simply going to be canvas width and canvas height. Our minimum imaginary number. Let's start out with negative 2.0. 2.0. Same with our, you know what, I'm going to do this again. Because that is just entirely too cool. Uh, can I do this? Nope. Nope. Can't do that either. Alright. Equals 2.0. And then the minimums I'm going to change to negatives. Oh, I like that a lot. Great. Oh, and these all need VARs too, huh? Alright. Cool. Um, we'll create our buffer. So... Vertex buffer equals gl.create buffer. Our vertices is going to be, our first triangle is going to be across the lower right side, so that's going to start in the upper right corner, so that's 1.0. Uh, um, you know what, I'm just going to copy it over. Don't need to refigure this out. This is going to be the upper left triangle, I believe. So yes, negative x, positive y, that's up there. Negative x, negative y, so that's down there. x, y, that's across over here. So, um, or wait a second. Oh, yeah, 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 that's across over there. And then the other triangle is across this upper right corner. Great. So let's bind the buffer in question, which is going, we are going to want to be binding an array buffer type. And our vertex buffer is what we want to be binding. And let's set the data gl.array buffer new float float32 array and we want to be using static draw great cool and because we only have one attribute this should be pretty easy so uh, vertex position attribute is going to be get attrib location program v position I'm pretty sure that's what I called it in the vertex shader here yeah, V post. We're good. GL vertex attrib pointer. V position attribute. We're using two floats. We are not using normalized data, so false. Uh, the width of the structure of each vertex is going to be two floats. So two times the size of a float. Set that to zero. Let's finally enable the vertex attrib array. 
Make sure we haven't got any errors yet. Yep, somehow we've managed not to get any errors. Fantastic. So now in our main render loop, the last thing we're going to do after we've cleared everything is I want to set all of those uniforms. So the first one is going to be our, let's see, I called it uniforms.viewportdimensions. And I'm going to set this to this VP dimensions object over here. And then all the other ones, min i, min i, max i, min r, max r. Cool. So far, so good. Um, we've already cleared everything, so finally we will draw what's in our active buffer, which, because we're not ever binding any other buffers, it will be that one. We're going to be drawing triangles, and we're going to be drawing six points. Cool. So it looks like I got the colors just a little bit backwards of what I was expecting. So let's go back into our fragment shader. Did I close the fragment shader? Apparently I, f I closed the fragment shader. Alright, so let's go back into the fragment shader, and we'll just switcheroo these around. Cool. And that will give us a blue background with a, or a black background with a blue Mandelbrot image across the top. And for now, this is where I'm going to stop. We've set up everything. You can see now if I resize. Oh, okay. Oh, right, right, right. So, not quite done. Um, I forgot to add actually what happens when we resize. So I am going to move this resize function in here to the very bottom, and that is because we are going to be modifying these variables whenever we resize. So the viewport dimensions is what needs to change. Um, so the viewport dimensions is going to be again that canvas width, canvas height. Cool, so now if we do that you can see it should stretch and shrink the image, yep, as I resize, which is not the desired effect, but it'll be just fine for now. Um, so that's all for this video. In the next video, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show how to add the listeners for when you click and drag across for you to kind of scale or uh, like look, change where you're looking at on the Mandelbrot image. And then when you zoom in and out with the mouse wheel, how to uh, have that affect the zoom level of this image. Um, a lot of that's going to go into the on resize, and then we're also going to add two more event handlers and finish this up. So thanks again for watching. Stick around for the next video. Hope you enjoyed.